Listener Production. Hi, Sasha Barbagat with you. Welcome to The Briefing. Gen Z Australians are facing pretty big challenges. There's housing affordability, soaring rents, rising uni fees, climate change and an uncertain global future. And so often the big decisions that affect young Aussies are made by people much, much older than them who don't have the same insight into those issues as the people living and breathing them. Well, a 24-year-old in Canberra and her 22-year-old advisor are changing all that. I've been heckled in chamber and it's crap. I didn't realise that adults could be so mean, to be honest, you know. And it's, a lot of the things, like, the mics don't pick up. But you wonder at some point, I know there's there were a few moments that I was sitting there recently going, actually, the arguing is almost detracting from the issue. In today's briefing, Antoinette Latouf sits down with 24-year-old Laura Nuttall, the youngest Greens MP elected to Parliament and the first Gen Z MP in the ACT, along with her 22-year-old advisor, Danny Hunterford. Before that, though, Katrina Blowers is here with the headlines. It's Thursday, the 30th of May. Hi, everyone. Well, we're waking up to the news of another major data breach, this time at Ticketmaster, with the details of 500 million global users reportedly compromised. Notorious hacking group Shiny Hunters is claiming responsibility for this one. It's a hack of 1.3 terabytes of data, including customer names, addresses, phone numbers, credit card and other payment details, It could be used to commit identity fraud and the hackers are trying to sell this info online. Australians have likely been caught up in the breach with the Home Affairs Department confirming it is aware of the incident and is working with Ticketmaster to get more information, but then referred any other questions directly to the ticket seller. And Katrina, I had a pretty decent look on Ticketmaster's website this morning, tried to find any sort of information, even just a confirmation that they were aware of the reports and that they would advise customers further soon. None to be found. There was uh, there was no banner on the homepage. I went to the help us. I went to the contact us pages. Absolutely nothing. And I think this is one of the issues, as we saw with Optus and the inquiry that came out around that, the need for more clearer communication to keep customers up to date when things like this happen, because it's really scary for a lot of people. Yeah. And at this stage, you know, we mentioned Australians have been involved. We don't know how many just at this point in time. I guess, you know, we, we do need some more of that transparent information you just mentioned there to come from Ticketmaster, but Australia is one of 35 countries Ticketmaster operates in. The Immigration Minister is digging his heels in and refusing to resign as a fight over visas heats up. So to recap quickly, this all started with a government directive called Direction 99 that saw convicted killers, rapists and child abusers allowed to stay in Australia. The direction was issued by the Immigration Minister Andrew Giles last year, which asked a tribunal to take into account the ties an immigrant had to the Australian community when deciding if they should get a visa and be released from immigration detention. Since then, though, it's been revealed the tribunal reinstated the visas of convicted rapists as well as drug smugglers and kidnappers, and a man jailed for choking the mother of one of his children was allowed to stay in the country by the tribunal and weeks later allegedly murdered a man in Brisbane. Yeah, so there was a pretty fiery question time in Parliament yesterday and Anthony Albanese announced the directive will be revised. The new directive will ensure that the protection order, the committee order. outweighs members, any members other considerations. On my left will cease. Yeah, whatever way you look at this, it has been a mess for the government. Uh, the coalition is now calling on Giles to resign from the portfolio, but he is refusing to stand down. Um, the Liberal leader, Peter Dutton, unsurprisingly is latching onto this. But Sasha, you were doing some analysis and, and you found that, um, you know, there were some pretty similar things that went on under his leadership too. Mm, 146 criminals were released into the Australian community when he was Immigration and Home Affairs Minister, uh, among them also murderers, rapists and child abusers. And I think it shows the system isn't working and kind of blaming one side or the other. Not to say that we shouldn't hold governments to account and this is a serious issue, uh, but it does feel a bit like the pot calling the kettle black. 
Some major drama about to come to an end in the US. Donald Trump's hush money trial. The jury in that is now deliberating. Trump was heard saying in the hallway as the jurors were sent off to consider his fate that, quote, Mother Teresa could not beat these charges. The charges are rigged. Um, P.S. Mother Teresa wouldn't be on those charges, Trump. Judge Juan Merchant reminded jurors they should not consider Trump's possibility of winding up in jail or speculate on his punishment when they were deciding the verdict, uh, as that isn't their responsibility. Mm, Yes, no, Mother Teresa would not be facing those sort of charges. And to remind everyone, Trump is charged with falsifying business records in relation to paying off adult film actor Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Now, this allegedly was... Trump trying to cover up this alleged affair that he had with Stormy Daniels uh, and the payment was reportedly 130000 US and that was given to Daniels days before the election. And Katrina, you know, this is the first criminal trial of a US president ever, either current or prior. Uh, it's a big deal. It really is. And for uh, the the start of all of this, people were wondering whether, you know, because he was getting so much more media exposure and it was really um, enabling him to continue that narrative of, you know, the system is broken and I'm the only one you can trust, you know, that that it was appealing right to Trump heartland voters. So, um, but I think as time has gone on and, and he said, more and more bizarre things and had to be reprimanded by judges for those things. I don't know that it is playing in his favour anymore. Yeah. Well, it's interesting uh, to watch the polls and we know polls can sometimes get it wrong, but it still has Trump and Biden pretty neck and neck. Uh, the One poll says 46 to Trump, 45 to Biden. Another one I saw said it was 50-50 even. So, his supporters do love to um, think of him as hard done by or beleaguered or under fire from, you know, from certain sections of the community. So it does play into his playbook. And for the first time ever, temperatures in Delhi have passed 50 degrees Celsius. India's capital and other parts of the country are in the midst of a record-breaking heat wave that has sparked government warnings about water shortages. The previous record was set just yesterday at 49.9 degrees. Before that, it was 49.2 as the record back in 2002. There have been unverified readings, though, as high as 52 degrees, which the India meteorological department is in the process of confirming. Katrina, I had a look at aircon numbers because I think, you know, if something like that was happening here in Australia, we're a very lucky society here. Lots of us have access to air conditioning. Lots of us don't, uh, but I'd say the number is pretty high in Australia. In Delhi, uh, reports suggest that it's about a quarter of all households having air conditioning. And the interesting thing with Delhi is that it is a a city of polar opposites. You have the very rich and then you have the very poor as well. The media was speaking to like a street cart vendor who said, I can't go inside. I can't avoid this heat. I have to sell this fruit and vegetables so that I can put food on the table at home. It's really sad. Yeah, it's it's really grim and, you know, looking ahead to what it could mean for the European summer that's coming up. Um, mm. You mentioned then the divide between rich and poor and it certainly feels that way. And when you look on Instagram and everyone's on their hot Euro summers, <laughs> this will literally be another hot Euro summer. They are predicting um, that there's going to be heat waves in a lot of the same places that there were last year. So if you're planning to fly out, um, keep that into account. Um, last year they had to shut the Acropolis during the day because it was so hot and Greece and Croatia in particular they are thinking are going to be just as hot if not hotter than they were last year. Interestingly though there's been a spike in um, tourism numbers and bookings to other countries like Norway and Switzerland Mm. and Sweden Um, so they could be the new it destinations to beat the heat. Who knows we might start getting our feed full of um, people going to mountainous, delightful, you know, Swiss family Robinson country. 
Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I did go to Europe last year and we went in late September. It was still really hot. And I think it's interesting you talked about the new trends of places that people are going. Uh, You know, it's one of those effects of climate change that we're going to see increasingly where people are just adapting and going, okay, well, instead of going to Florence in July, I'm going to go to Oslo and then maybe saving the Florence trip for later in the year when it'll still be warm, um, but not those record temperatures that we saw last year. And as you said, we'll likely see this year. Katrina, thanks so much for joining us for the headlines today. Next up, it's our deep dive looking at the first ACT Gen Z politician and what she plans to do for young people in Australia. Hey, it's Antoinette with you. Few teenagers, I reckon, know what they want to be when they grow up. But my guests today, they both knew what they wanted to be. And they made a beeline straight for Canberra and politics. For Laura Nuttall, at 20, she put her hand up to run for the Greens in the ACT seat of Brindabella, hoping to win a seat in the Territory's Legislative Assembly. She lost. And fast forward a few years, the MP who did win the election resigned after an alleged sex scandal. And under the ACT's electoral system, if someone resigns or quits, they go back to the last election and do a recount and the second place getter wins. So at 24 years old, Laura became the youngest ever Greens represented elected to any Australian parliament. Laura is also the first Gen Z member of the ACT Legislative Assembly ever. I met her and her 22-year-old advisor, Danny Hunterford, at an event in Canberra recently, and I just had to get them on the podcast. Laura and Danny, thanks so much for joining the briefing. I want to ask both of you, and perhaps Laura, you can answer first, like, when did you decide to enter politics? Because a lot of people in their early 20s are like, which country can I backpack to next? Sort of the, 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 the big decision they make. Oh, look, with the cuzzy lives, that wasn't an option. But um, <laughs> no, so I decided, I think probably back in 2019, I realised that I wanted to be engaged in politics. I saw, particularly for young people, the sort of crises that we're going to have to deal with, like the climate crisis and the housing crisis, those ones in particular. And I thought I'd love to get involved in politics. And from there, it was actually just a confluence of events, I sort of, I, I think I it was maybe the second event that I went to and I got uh, roped into helping to organise the trivia night um, and we realised we just didn't have that many people down south to run and so a couple of people in the party asked me at the time, well, would you consider doing it? And me sort of going into political science at uni, having a general interest in politics and they sort of assured me that my face wouldn't be in too many places and it would be sort of paper candidate. They went, oh, yeah, absolutely, it would be a great experience. So... <laughs> That's when I put my hand back up in 2020 to run as a support candidate on the ticket with no real expectations of getting in. We were lucky if we got one seat. And so I thought, well, you know, it's, it's a safe bet. Um, but since then, I actually uh, I ended up working in the Assembly and really starting to understand how important and tangible local politics is. And I thought this is really, really interesting. So when the opportunity arose to contest the count back back in 2023, I thought, it would be an awesome opportunity and I'd be a huge hypocrite if I thought to myself every day, we need to see more young people in politics and then I didn't put up my hand. So, And what about you, Danny? Because you're even younger. I grew up in Lismore. With all of the flooding that had happened, I was sort of exposed to inequality at a very young age and that sort of inspired me to take up politics. I moved to Canberra independently when I was in year 11 and in year 12 I worked on a federal Senate campaign And then I took up a few different other career paths um, whilst pursuing my bachelor's degree in political science. And I ended up here in Laura's office (laughs) and I'm now doing my master's degree in public policy. Um, Politics has always been a passion. Like I've always been on the student representative council. (laughs) Um, I feel like it's the, it's just the pathway. (laughs) Yeah. So Laura, you're the first Gen Z MP in the ACT. Clearly, Danny, you're obviously very passionate about issues impacting young people. So I'll start with you, Laura. Like, what would you say are the biggest priorities for young people from what you're hearing and seeing? For young people, sort of all the things that affect the rest of the population affect young people too. But really, for me, the things I hear most often is probably housing, to be honest with you. It's probably, you know, 
we had to look up recently how what income you need to be earning to afford an average like to be a homeowner in the ACT and it's over two hundred thousand dollars and that's pretty crap um and not a lot of young people have the opportunity even my salary wouldn't cover it at this point and for a lot of young people one of the conversations that we do have I, we were moving house recently i sort of walked upstairs and my friends were talking about what they do you know whether they'd be renting their entire lives and it's not like rent is cheap uh in fact rent is extremely mm. expensive and i think for a lot of young people it's really just working out how you're going to survive, live comfortably and save up because we've been given this sort of dream that, you know, you go to uni, you get a good job out of that, mm. you pay off your hex somehow. And what we're actually seeing now is young people going, oh, it's actually gotten so much more expensive than the time where everyone else who was quite reasonably giving that advice was actually, you know, going through the same thing. So for us, it's that sort of housing financial anxiety. And don't even get me started on the climate crisis, I think. For a lot of us, we kind of joke about it a lot. I think that's that morbid humour. But it's really one of those problems that, well, it feels way too big for any one person to solve. It's one that we really need to be getting on top of. And I think I'd really love to work out how to galvanise people and make sure they feel like it is still possible to do something about climate. Danny, as an advisor hearing about climate and housing affordability, they are two big issues, two big issues that often feel impossible to fix or that there isn't the political will to do so. What have your experiences been like in policy in terms of coming up with solutions? Look, it's been really inspiring working for Laura. Laura is someone that really just wants results and wants to see tangible things change, um, which is really inspiring. And that's sort of the drive behind everything. And that's what keeps us going and the Greater Greens team going is that we've got such amazing MPs elected. Um, And so having that as like a driving force is incredible. One thing that we worked on recently was vaping. Mm. And that was a really amazing thing to be able to do here in the ACT. So talk us through what was achieved. We achieved sort of the... uh, looking the investigation into the establishment of support services for those that are under 18 that vape. Vaping has become a massive problem for our generation specifically. Um, it's become so wildly accessible on the black market mm. um, and there's nothing in place to help those that are under 18 quit smoking. Yeah. I remember you coming to me, Danny, early on because I think, Danny, this has been a passion project of yours for a while and a focus of your master's degree. But um just coming in and saying, hey, so you know how those federal reforms are coming in, you know, young people won't, if you're under 18, it's not like a doctor is going to prescribe you something with nicotine in it. Mm. And we thought about the services that would be available in Cameron, we were racking our brains and we realised, yeah, there are no clear pathways for young people who face the opportunity of either, you know, going cold turkey on a nicotine addiction, which isn't great, having to, you know, see the GP, which might be quite complicated, especially if it's not something that you would feel comfortable bringing up with your parents or getting it illegally. And we know that the vape market will continue. It's uh, people, people find their ways um, and it's a really difficult space to sort of regulate. So we were quite worried mm-hmm. about that, you know, how that prohibition would affect young people in the ACT. So we're really, you know, proud of that work. And I understand that the the round table might have happened. Yes, we had like a stakeholder round table to sort of work on a solution for vaping in the ACT. Mm. Um, and that's happened already. So we look forward to yeah. seeing that report soon. What do you say to critics who might suggest that you're too young or too inexperienced to be an MP or Danny for you to be an advisor? Oh, I've been waiting for this one. Um, this, yeah, it's and it's something we get all the time. In fact, around the time that before I was elected, I was reading opinion pieces in the like the local sort of newspaper, going, "Oh, is she a bit young for it?" You know, and one of the common criticisms is that a young person like lacks life experience. It's like, no, actually, I've got a whole lot of experience in the education system. You know, as a young person facing climate, as someone paying off my hex debt and renting and just trying to make ends meet. And I think there's, I have a real issue with this idea that children should be seen and not heard. Like, yeah, mm. we'll let you vote, but you're not necessarily representative. It's really important to have as much diversity as possible. Mm. I think we're getting there. 
I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we see enough gender diverse representatives. Um, I don't think we see enough people of colour elected. I think the more diversity we have, I honestly believe the better our democracy will be. So Yeah, and just to add on that, politics should be representative and that mm. is across the board. Yeah. And I think it's really important that all elements of politics stay representative, Absolutely. even behind the scenes. But that narrative needs to change. Absolutely. Like it needs to be accepted that young people can be in politics and young people should be in politics. And Laura, you've been in Parliament for just over six months. Has it lived up to your expectation? One of the things that has surprised me is sometimes like how willing people are to go along your, with your ideas. And to me, like within committee processes and things, that's, you know, um, the way it's set up. We have sort of standing committees and that's one um, Labor, one Liberal, one Greens uh, member. And actually like the amount of collaboration that can happen in that sort of small cross-party section, but also a little bit the theatre within the chamber. I think that's something that I am still getting used to and it's election year. So people are on their, you know, best and most extroverted behaviour. So I've been heckled in chamber and it's crap. I didn't realise that adults could be so mm. mean, to be honest, you know, and it's a lot of the things like the mics don't pick up, but you sort of, you wonder at some point, I know there's, there were a few moments that I was sitting there recently going, actually the arguing is almost detracting from the issue. So yeah, I try and keep my head down and just focus on the policy, but you might have five points of order on, you know, something untoward that someone said, and they're debating on whether or not to, you know, rule it parliamentary. And then we go back to discussing, you know, the cost of living or the transport system and things like that. So that's been an interesting revelation, but I think still it has surprised me how much we sort of get across the line each sitting, like, you know, it's legislation, it's motions, it's it's all of these things happening. Um, one of the big challenges is just staying on top of it all. But, yeah. From the outside, politics can look like a pretty horrible, brutal, unfair, unethical, <laughs> screamy in chambers place. What case would you make to encourage more young women to get into politics? To be honest, to any young women listening to this, we need you. Uh like we said before, like politics is supposed to be representative. And I think for a lot of young people, there's almost a sense of, yeah, like politicians need to be fixing up their act, but they're also difficult to reach out to. Like our main channels right now are still like email and phoning. And <laughs> I would really encourage young people listening, if you are curious about politics or if you think there's something in your community that needs to change, Socials are also a really, you know, valid avenue. And I find that that's got, a, you know, much lower barrier to entry. Like it's easier to sort of flick off a quick Instagram DM. And your politicians, if they're paying attention, they will see that and they should respond. And in terms of actually getting in, yes, it's a tough gig. I know I've had to sort of talk to my friends and family and say things like don't read the comments of the newspaper sections because people take total license to be mean. But if you have a strong crew around you, it's also one of the most rewarding things that you can do. Yeah, and just to add to that, Mm -hmm. um, the only people that are going to change the narrative in politics are young people. That is the future and that's why young, specifically women, gender diverse, multicultural, we need diversity in politics to change the narrative. I'm sick of the old white men. (laughs) (laughs) We need need more young people. Exactly. Yeah. And it's the only way change is going to happen. Amazing. It's been brilliant to speak to both of you. Thank you so much for having us on. That's Laura Nuttall and Danny Hunterford. Well, there you have it. You've heard it. Their plea for why more young people should get into politics. Thanks for listening to today's briefing. That's all for this morning. Before you go, though, we'd love it if you could share this episode with someone you think might enjoy it. If you want to keep up with other content, you can check us out on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast and on TikTok and also YouTube. Just search Listener Newsroom. I'm Antoinette Latouf. Catch you next time. Listener.